Moving to order the Thursday, March 24th, 2022 meeting of the Mashpee Conservation Commission. Is there anyone in the audience who has business before this commission that is not currently on the agenda? Lynn, if you could come forward and identify yourself for the record. I just wanted to make public comment. Of course, Lynn. Now? Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> Lynn Barbie, Surf Drive. I don't want to take up a lot of time, but I have a handout to give you all. Um, I just wanted to share some information. <clears throat> um, I've submitted an article for the town warrant, and it mentions the Conservation Commission. <laughs> And it addresses um, issues about the wetlands. And so I just will hand this out to you. And if there is a chance, again, to you know, answer questions about this or whatever, it has not been heard. heard. We have not had our hearing at the uh, planning board yet. But I do have some documents that I'm just hoping people will be informed about this article, because presumably we will, you will have a chance to vote on it at the town meeting. <clears throat> and I will just give these to you all and not take up more time. Thank you, Lynn. This one doesn't have everything in it. There's four completely Thank you, Lynn. We'll review uh, what you've given us, and uh, feel free to reach out if you'd like to talk with us further or set up a Q&A session before the commission. Next, we'll call the uh, presentation by Wendy Williams on Trout Pond. Thank you all for coming tonight to hear this talk. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. I'm more comfortable speaking when I stand. I hope you all don't mind. I feel like I'm not facing the audience. But um, I'm here tonight to talk about the intrinsic value of Trout Pond. And it's in honor of my friend, Bella Jean Thomas, who saved so many important parcels of land in Mashpee. Um, sadly, Jean's been kind of forgotten at this point, but I aim to make that change because when we buy the 32 acres of Trout Pond, it's going to be named the Bella Jean Thomas Forest Preserve. And that will fulfill my duty to my much beloved friend who sadly died about 10 years ago. Um, next slide. This is Jean accepting money from that fancy pantsy governor, Angus King. And this was a check from Angus, I think, for South Cape Beach. The reason I'm confused is that two different governors gave Jean money, big checks, to buy South Cape Beach and also to buy the Mashpee River Woodlands, another much beloved piece of property that we own in town. So as you can see, there's Jean. She can't believe she actually achieved her goal, but she did. And there's the money, and we own the land. So next slide, please. If you want to know more about Jean, Richard DeSort did a wonderful story about her last fall, and you'll learn a lot about her. Jean was, in my opinion, the greatest selectman at Mashpee ever had. She had only a high school education, and she decided that we were going to buy these beautiful pieces of land. Certain people in town laughed at her, but you know what? She bought it anyway. And now we have that lovely land to enjoy. Next. So this is another friend of mine, also sadly long deceased. This is Don Griffin, researching at Trout Pond. Don worked down there at Trout Pond with my husband, who's back there, who's going to have a little bit to say at the end of this talk. And Don was maybe the world's most famous bat scientist. In 1939, the year before World War II, Don discovered that bats echolocate. And for those of you who don't know, it means that bats communicate, find their way 
not by eyes, although some can also see, but not mainly by eyes, by sending out the kinds of what we think of as sonar, kind of like um, dolphins do in the ocean. When Don gave his talk, he was just a whippersnapper at Harvard, and some of the old guys at Harvard came up and shook his shoulders and said, you can't mean that, because nobody, when he discovered this, could imagine that animals could do anything that we couldn't do. So Don's discovery was not just very cool in itself, but it changed the way we looked at animals, because animals have talents that we don't have. And that was a real wowzer, wowzer discovery. So as Don was older, he was talking about the colony of bats that he studied in the 1930s here in Mashpee. And he said, I wish I knew where they went. And my husband, Greg, back there said, I know where they are. And they came down here, and they set up shop. And their research was so famous, by the way, that a team of um, movie makers, filmmakers, came all the way from Paris to make a really amazing film about their research. So this is the cover. Okay. This is the cover of Don's very famous book, written in 1953 or 1957, 1950s, Listening in the Dark, about how he discovered as a young whippersnapper that bats echolocate. And if you turn, go to the next slide, right there, right in the middle of that page, it mentions the Mashpee bats. It says, when he was down here, he tagged bats here in Mashpee, at the Mashpee Meeting House, and also at Trout Pond. And when he found those bats that had been tagged, they had migrated all the way up to Vermont, hundreds of miles away. Who would have thought that bats would winter in Vermont? I don't like Vermont. It's got too much snow, so that's why I'm down here. But Don discovered that they went to a, um, to a cave there, which had a completely even routine temperature that was perfect for them. And that's where they spent our winters. Sometimes they come back early, and Greg's going to tell you, my husband's going to tell you about that soon. So let's go to the next. This is the sentence from Listening in the Dark. I see the year is 1958. From 1934 to 1937, more than 1,000 Myotis lucivigus were banded at a colony at the old Indian church at Mashpee, and considerable numbers have been caught and examined for bands almost every summer to date. So you can see that this colony of bats, of the little brown bats, are extremely valuable, not just to us now, but they're valuable for historic reasons as well. We have a lot of data about them because of Don. True. Don's uh, research in bats yielded a lot of important findings. Um, for one thing, he found a Mashpee bat that had survived for 14 years. At that point, nobody ever believed that bats could live that long. Now it turns out that some bats actually live a lot longer than that. But for Don's era, when, when he was really the first person to research bats at all, um, for him to find that a Mashpee bat lived for more than 14 years was groundbreaking. And also, he found that they went north to winter in that cave, which I've already told you about. If you want to know more about Don's research, Ryan, our Mashpee Enterprise reporter, Ryan Spencer from last fall, did a wonderful story about him that showed up in the Mashpee Enterprise. Um, I actually have copies of that here, if you would like to get some copies, and I can let you have them and read them. Here is Don walking down the road to Trout Pond. Um, it looks like a road to us, but actually, that was a dam. It had been there for decades and decades and decades. And as you can see, you could drive over it. You could park there. There's Don having set up his equipment. And now, let's go to the next slide. This is what it looked like last fall. This road, which actually is a public road, it's an ancient way, and we have a legal right to use it, had been allowed to deteriorate to an unbelievable extent. Unbelievable. It simply was not being taken care of at all. Next slide. Mashpee Commons had known of this ongoing degradation for at least 25 years. The proof of that is this letter from the trustees of the reservation. For those of you who don't know, the trustees is, in my opinion, the most phenomenal land conservation group in the world. Uh, we belong to it. I love it. It was the first conservation group. In fact, the British Trust is modeled after our Massachusetts Trust. Um, and they own land that abuts 
that a butts trout pond above Chase's land, and they sent a letter as early as 1996 asking the town to get this fixed. And it didn't get fixed, and it didn't get fixed. So, and it didn't get fixed, and it didn't get fixed. This is what it looked like last fall. Now, this is what it looks like. Thank you, Conservation Commission and Concerned Citizens of Mashpee. I don't need to tell you on the Conservation Commission what you've achieved. I'm sure you all know that. It took you a lot of work to get him to actually spend the money on making a decent, safe dam that would allow people to continue using their ancient way and that would make existence for the animals that live there safe as well. Um, but you did take action, and there was a great deal of citizen outcry, and it finally got fixed. This is one of the innovations that they put in. Um, what this means is that if we get a huge rainstorm now, the overflow goes in there and it goes where it should go instead of over the dam and washing out the dam. So if you'll notice, it hasn't been planted yet. This is, I'm told, because they did this in December, really. They did this, really, at the end of the year. And they promised that they're going to do plantings and um, take care of that now once spring comes, which is basically here. So my husband and I will be watching out to be sure they do that. This is Trout Pond as it exists today from the air. Most, a lot of you haven't heard of Trout Pond before we started bellowing about it because it's not a recreation pond. People don't go there and sit on the beach because there isn't really a beach. They don't go there and swim because it's not really good for swimming. The people, the, the living things that go there are the animals, the wildlife, the birds. It's really important for spring nesting. Um, and it's kind of inaccessible. You can walk there if you want, um, and it's a lovely walk. We do it a lot. It's not that hard, but it's not meant as a recreation pond. It's meant as a pond that is there, a wetland slash pond that's there for land for animal conservation, for wildlife conservation. Um, so that's why people haven't heard of it. But you can see there is a little outflow that goes down to the Mashpee River. So as we know, last summer and last fall, Mashpee Commons um, decided that they wanted to expand their shopping mall to a considerable degree, and it was a matter of heated debate. I think that's probably an understatement. Um, exactly what Mashpee Commons wanted to do wasn't clear, but the best guess we could get was from an engineering drawing that they themselves paid for. This was put out by... Um, an engineering firm that they hired to do some research for them. And um, the yellow part you'll see is what we have now. The rest is what they hope to have. And as you'll see, over there in the Trout Pond area, the land that we want to take by eminent domain, are a considerable number of condominiums. That's not really appropriate for this land. It's too delicate. It's um, too important. It's got historic resources. Pre-contact artifacts have been found there. Do we want to ruin that land with condominiums? I don't think so. And I think most people in town that I've talked to agree. So there are a lot of different reasons why we want to preserve this land. Um, it's, not just global, it's not just endangered bats um, that use this land. There are a lot of other species there. It's also important because this land is contiguous to land that's been conserved, first of all, by my friend Bella Jean Thomas, but also by the trustees of reservations. So when we buy this 32 plus or minus acres, we will be creating a large contiguous swath of land that will be there for passive recreation, walking and that sort of thing, and it will be there for the wildlife to use. Um, Saving Trout Pond will help save the Mashpee River. As you saw from the earlier map, there is an outflow from the Trout Pond that goes down to the river. And if we can protect that outflow and keep that water clean, which the dam will help us do now that there's not erosion going in there, that will help us take care of the Mashpee River. Additionally, above Trout Pond is a, it's not really a cliff, but it's a steep embankment. And there are, a lot of, um, there are a lot of drainage areas that come out, flow out from that steep embankment 
and into Trout Pond. So we want to try to keep that water as pure and as clean as possible. Also, this is prime recreation land. When I walk down there, and I walk down there a lot, I talk to, I meet people who are there to go fishing, kids who are there with their bicycles, um, lots of birders, and mostly people who just have come from all over the place, not just from Mashpee, but from all over the place to walk in this area because they've heard how beautiful it is. I've met people who come from north of Boston just to walk in the Mashpee River woodlands. Thank you, Jean, for doing that for people. All right, so what's next? This is the land that we want. Um, it's not, a, this map isn't exactly precise because we have submitted a petition to the Springtown meeting explaining that we would like to take this land. So a little bit of that up around the rotary has been cut out from there because people say they want the ice cream shop to stay. They want the lunch store and the ice cream shop to stay, and that's okay with me. They're funky businesses that belong on Cape Cod. So um, you'll see there's an acreage of about four parcels there. That, it equals about 32 acres. And you can see that it's valued at somewhere around $4 million. That's what Mashpee Commons and Buff Chase have been paying taxes on. So how do we pay $4 million? This sounds terrible, doesn't it? Well, guess what? There are tons of federal and state um, funds that will help us pay for this. The Federal Land and Water Fund, which helped us pay for South Cape Beach, and it helped us pay for um, the Mashpee River Woodlands, will pay 50%. They might even pay a little bit more, but they will pay 50% of the cost of this land just because they consider it valuable. There are a number of criteria that are required by the federal government, and we meet almost all of those criteria. The land has to have historic significance, it has to have recreational significance, it has to have conservation significance, it's very helpful if there are indigenous people with evidence of their existence on this land. We check almost all those boxes. So we can look forward to half of this being paid by the Federal Land and Water Fund. There's a state equivalent fund that pays 25%. And that's what happened when Jean acquired that land, too. The state fund will pay another 25% of whatever we pay. So we're on the hook for 25% or a million dollars. That sounds like a lot of money to me, and it probably sounds like a lot of money to you. But two factors you need to think of. First of all, there's millions of dollars in our community preservation accounts. So we can afford that million, that million if we're on the hook for a million. But what's even more important is we can get contributions from a ver variety of groups towards whatever the town is on the hook for. Let's imagine that Audubon contributes some money. Let's imagine that the, uh, a number of our conservation groups in, on the Cape contribute money. I'll contribute $5,000. Chad will contribute money. I mean, you'll all contribute money. We can do this, all right? So we don't have to make the town come up with the entire $1 million. We can put this package together, and we can have this beautiful piece of land for the public, and it really won't have any effect at all on our taxes. So, next slide. These are some of the animals that have been down there. That's a picture of a little brown bat that was taken back when Don Griffin and my husband were working down there, and what weasels, birds, everything is down there, and we want to give them a healthy pond. And what's important, we need reliable and consistent stewardship. Because I know the Conservation Commission does not want to have to go through this effort again, getting Buff Chase and Mashpee Commons to take care of that dam. Once is enough. Now, I'm going to let my husband talk to you. He was down at Trout Pond a couple of nights ago. He's already got some important bat data from this spring. And I'm going to contribute another 5000 to it. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Greg Auger. And uh, I had the privilege of going down to uh, Trump. Can you sit down? Because we can't see over sure. your head. Sure. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I had the privilege to go down to Trout Pond last Sunday, and I left a device, which is the audiology version of a uh, trail cam. 
It doesn't take pictures. It takes audio. And for the bat world, it only takes bat song, sounds, and even audio that's above 25 uh, kilohertz, which is way above our hearing. The good news is I pulled the data from it. Uh, up on the slide, you're gonna, you can see 15 seconds worth of data. And each white vertical line on there is a bat call. That's good news. The real good news is down below that chart, you can see the different bats that were found. Uh, the first one left to right is 56. That was big brown bats. That's a common bat, but it's, it's definitely using the, the uh, pond for feeding and drinking every night. The last one, Myotis lucificus, the uh, 26, this is a bat that 14 years ago was the most common bat probably in the United States. Now it is critically endangered, according to IUCN. This is due to because uh, uh, white, white nose syndrome, a problem where that affects them during hibernation. Last year, I went down to the pond and I detected maybe four of the uh, bats down there. This is 26 and 15 seconds. So the bat is now using the pond again. I can't pin that only on the, uh, on the dam and the uh, restored level of the pond, but this is really good news. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, Wendy and Greg, I appreciate the information. I uh, appreciate, uh, I know this is an issue you're clearly passionate and knowledgeable about. And as um, passions tend to be flaring lately, I very much appreciate the tone you delivered it in. Thank you. Should we proceed with the hearings? Sure. And we'll come back to the pre post agenda afterwards. Now calling the 6 o'clock hearing for David M. and Anna S. Ferris, 36 Seconset Point Road, proposed dredging and expansion modification of pier, ramp, and float. Representative is Cape and Islands Engineering. This is an NOI. So the hearing has been requested to be continued to April 14th at 6.06 .06 p.m. Uh, to allow time for the shellfish constable to properly assess conditions uh, for the proposed dredging. Thank you, Drew. Do I hear a motion? I would move that we continue this application of David M. and Anna S. Ferris, 36 Seconset Point Road, to April 16th, 14th, 14th at 6.06 .06 p.m. at the request of the applicant. Thank you, Brad. Do we hear a second? I will second that, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Paul. Is there any discussion? Now voting. Tom. Aye. Brad. Yes. Paul. Yes. Charlie? Yes. I vote aye as well. Motion carries. Now calling the 603 hearing, 25 Uncle Percy's Road, proposed septic system upgrade. Representative of Environmental Services. This is an RDA. Hi, my name is Carmen Shea from Shea Environmental Services. I'm here on behalf of uh, David Cilio, uh, who's the owner of 25 Uncle Percy's. And, uh, he basically currently has a field cesspool that's in the corner of the lot that you see there on the plan view, uh, which is in dire need of repair. So basically we're just looking to upgrade the septic system to a Title V compliant system, and it's within an AE10 flood zone. Uh, so we have a RDA that we've submitted and requested negative determination. Drew, comments? Too much to add to this. Um, as was stated, it's an upgrade of an existing septic system. There's no increase in flow. There are no other wetlands within 100 feet of the property. Um, area of subject. Uh, I'll show you some photos. So this is uh, this is 25 Uncle Persis here, highlighted in green. You can see this is in an area of uh, landlocked area of land subject to coastal storm flows. So 100 year floodplain. Nearly all the property is in a pre, pre disturbed, um, legally altered condition, uh, landscaping and hardscaping. So you can see here on the 
top left photo, this is a group on the road looking at the uh, top right, looking at the backyard there's the test pit. This is where the work is proposed. Um, just another shot of that same area on the other side of the home and uh, looking back out towards the street uh, from the back of the home. Um, Carmen, do you know if any of these trees, like the tree here in this photo, this is looking back out of the street. Thank you. Um, are these trees need to be removed at all for access, or is there any? No, we're, we're going to come down the driveway, the driveway and right down beside the three-season room. That's going to be on the left side if you're looking from the street. Yeah. And, you know, currently the renter has, you know, a camper and boat trailer and stuff like that, so that's all being moved, and essentially will give us the access to work. We're moving the deck because the system is a ray system, and then you can see the retaining wall that's proposed around both the tank and the leaching area. And so um, other than hardscape, nothing else is really being proposed as the deck will be kind of useless. It'll be at a different elevation than the, the system's currently proposed to be about 18 inches higher than the existing grade um, with a, a lock and block retaining wall. So it'll look nice decorative. You know, there's no runoff issues relative to that other than the 2% slope that'll be crowned over the septic system for purposes of, you know, Title V compliance and not having water sitting on top of that retaining wall area. Nothing else will really change, uh, and there should be no impact to any abutters. Uh, Everything is proposed so that it's not within 10 feet of any of the neighbors uh, as far as the actual system itself. And uh, that's about it. I mean, it's pretty cut and dry. Uh, Board of Health comments state that the engineer plans have been submitted with septic system permit issued for two bedrooms. Thank you, Caitlin. Thank you, Drew. Questions and comments from our commissioners? Uh, I have a question. Yes, Mr. It's, Secretary. The, the proposal is for a 2,000 gallon tank, but yet it's a two bedroom home? Okay, so it's a two compartment tank. Title V requires a minimum of a 1,500 gallon tank for any system, I don't care if it's a one bedroom. So therefore, the two compartments is so that the 500 gallon extra uh, compartment is for the pump chamber itself because we have an elevation issue above groundwater. And that's why the system is raised 18 okay. inches above current grade. Uh, so that's the appropriate tank for uh, such a system. And the only other option would have been put two tanks in, which we didn't have the room for. I see. Um, a couple of other questions. The groundwater elevation is one foot? Is that true? Uh, elevation one. Is that what we're asking right, about? Five feet provided from the bottom of the leach facility to yes. the groundwater. There is five feet provided as per Title V. The plan itself has actually been approved and permitted by the Board of Health. Right. It is in full compliance. Other questions? I just, I have some reservations. Um, when, when I see perk rates less than two minutes of an inch uh, and only five feet, I know that's standard. I just feel as though to provide the protection to the resource area, the groundwater, I don't know if Title V is cutting the bill. You're thinking of one why, of the systems that have been permitted recently in the vicinity. Why not an IA system that would reduce the nitrogen flow down to a rate of perhaps 5 to 10 rather than a standard Title V that has a rate of 26 to 46? You do I mean, have a system that's immediately across the street. I actually did the inspection on it a year or two ago that's probably providing no more protection, in fact, less protection than the system. You know, one, you've got a, a, a three-bedroom sized system for a two-bedroom home, which will, you know, essentially remain that way because you are in a zone two. You can't expand right. the number of bedrooms 
you know, by by just the nature of being within sure. the zone too, and you don't have the acreage, obviously, or the square footage of land. So it's a considerably bigger system than the actual occupancy could be at this house, and more than likely, the well, one, it's a hell of a lot better than accessible, <laughs> and two, it's. Um, you know, it's got the it's it's got the five feet of separation. It's a field that's going to disperse effluent equally along the whole area of the system, and um, I feel that an IA one I'd have a hard time fitting it, <laughs> um, and a pump chamber uh, without considerable number of other variances, and I think it'd be an un undue hardship to the property owner who's basically just trying to do the right thing here. We're not asking to like tear the house down and build a new one or something. Right. We're just literally, you know, we, we, we've got sewers that's at ground surface, you know, and other than pumping it every week, we, we just want to remedy the situation. And this was brought voluntarily to the, to the Board of Health's attention, uh, you know, in order to fix the situation, not under an order or, or an enforcement sure. order. The IA system would be um, ideal, and we have done that in past um, hearings where there's been a close proximity to Waterland, but I also do, the, that is a compelling argument, I think, that the um, being able to fit that system into the storm line is the hardship. What's your feeling on that? You know, I do get that piece, uh, but I also get the piece of protecting the resources. You know, it's, it's a trade-off, and I think in... In the larger picture, this is why we are where we are with water issues in Mashpee. So when things like this come before us with an opportunity maybe to find a better solution, I'd be remiss if I didn't speak up. Maybe we can sit down as a commission and look at um, what the threshold for size and um, that would trigger an IA system and start mm -hmm. putting some consistent policy together that we can go yep. forward with. Yep. That be done in conjunction with the Board of Health and accommodation. Two boards need to work together, it would seem to me, on that. Yeah, absolutely. If the recommendation comes to us, they have their expertise, we have ours. I think it needs to be put together and then come forward with one solution for the town. Consistency for everyone. Agreed. <clears throat> Is there any more discussion on the topic? I'm happy. Any comments from the audience? Hearing none, I would move for a negative determination in regards to the application of David J. DeCilio at 25 Uncle Percy's Road for a negative determination. Do I hear a second? Second. Thank you, Charlie. If there's no more discussion, we'll begin voting. Tom. Aye. Brad. Yes. Paul. No. Charlie. Yes. I vote aye as well. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a good night. <laughs> now calling the 606 hearing, 370 Monomasquoy Road, proposed septic system upgrade. Representative is Cape and Islands Engineering. This is an RDA. Good evening. For the record, Raul Isardi from Cape and Islands Engineering representing the applicant, Mr. and Mrs. Maciel at 370 Monomaskoy Island Road. Um, this project is a request for determination of applicability application um, for the proposed septic system upgrade. The system has failed. Um, the component that specifically failed is the leaching field. Um, it serves two houses on one property. Um, so what we're proposing to do is reconstruct the leaching field in the same footprint um, of the failed septic system. Um, it is more than 100 feet from any other resource area on the property, but it is within land subject to coastal storm flowage. Um, the system um, has the benefit of um, board of health variances to be able to be placed at this location, which is the furthest from any of the other resources um, far to the, to the east. Um, 
Um, that's practically um, the project in a nutshell. We do provide five foot separation to groundwater, but we don't have separations to the property lines and to the building in the front of the property. If there's any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you. Drew, comments? Again, this is a uh, upgrade to a failed system, the leaching field component. Um, no other resource areas within 100 feet outside of land subject to fill system on flow. Um, no increase in design flow. And just to show the commissioner <coughs> the site, top left, this is looking at the area. This is where the leach field is underneath this uh, private area here. It's another shot of the area. So it's looking at an entirely predisturbed uh, area when it comes to the septic install. Uh, bottom left is showing uh, at the end of this road, that's where you get into the wetland resource area. So it's well outside of the uh, buffer zone to those CBW uh, boarding bridge to the wetland and salt marsh. Uh, it's close to that accessible with the property. And that's what we're looking at back towards the road. Caitlin, um, you the Board of Health comments. Sure, the Board of Health states that engineer plans were submitted with septic system permit issued for five bedrooms. Thank you, Drew and Caitlin. Questions and comments from our commissioners? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, it, it's kind of like play and rewind. Um, I have the same exact concerns for this project. Um, I don't know why the tank's not being replaced with an IA system. I mean, now we have five bedrooms from two separate houses flowing into this with the same separation, same perk rate, same problem. Do you feel your client would be uh, at all interested in putting in the IA system? We are here. Yeah. We're all, we haven't met. We are here. We have extensive you have to come up to the... Uh, I apologize, ma'am. We have to yeah. have everyone come up and introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Patricia Maciel, my husband Raymond. Thank you. Um, we have extensive hardscaping in the back, um, and it would be financially difficult to, you know, rip all that that out. Um, you know. I don't know what what else, what other question you would have. Do so the engineers give you any consideration in terms of how much it would cost you by comparison so that you could do the comparison that you would describe so, to no, us? Well, well, the law to bar, well, you go ahead. Yeah. So yes, um, the, the cost of a AI system for trading what they currently have on site, on site um, will probably more than double the cost mm. um, in just materials. But then in construction, it will probably triple it because of the, all the extra um, excavation that has to happen. Also, we're dealing with existing conditions of two dwellings, existing um, building sewer at certain elevations. We start adding more components, we get even closer to groundwater. Um, so one of the things that we always target um, for septic upgrades, like the prior permit that was just presented, is to provide at least that five foot minimum separation. Um, and that's what we're doing, and that's what we're trying um, always to do. A lot of these systems in Mashpee, if, if not a good 90 plus percent, are in the outwash sandy soils. There's no getting away from the sandy soils in Mashpee. So the less than two minutes an inch is something throughout the entire town. Um, so yes, it is a rapid percolation. The water just goes through it. The five foot separation to groundwater is what the state at DEP and locally have determined that is a good substratum to treat um, effluent. But yes, there's other systems that can treat better. Um, but for this project, it's just a failed leaching component, mm -hmm. and that will be the concentration for the repair um, to a Title V um, system um, with the waivers from the Board of Health. Well, so you just, you just um, a system right next to us is is basically like this. You guys approved yeah, you not just, too long ago. Yeah, it's a bigger. I mean, lot, just recently I mean, you approved it, and it's probably it's closer to the water than ours is. So I, I see that the enhancement for nitrogen removal 
for increases in flow, it's, it's adequate. I do think that condition is applicable. For new constructions, I also see that that could be a condition that is um, applicable. But for septics that are failed and they're just repairing it um, to continue the use of what they currently have with no increase in flow, um, an AI system will be um, a substantial amount of um, additional cost to the owners um, for the projects. Other questions and commentary on Paul's question or uh, new questions that you might have? Paul is asking very good questions. I think what we're seeing right here is that uh, as we're realizing our water and the condition of our water all over Mashpee is not good, and we should be ashamed of ourselves for allowing us to get to that point. Now we're, we'd like to get it corrected. How do we get it corrected? How rapidly can we get it corrected by uh, our rules uh, that should be applied? And right now, I think we're not happy with the rules that we have in place and expect the homeowner to comply with. So we definitely have a dilemma, uh, and we need to strive for you know, a much better situation. We don't have it now, but we have to live with what we have. People can continue to enjoy their property. Right, and I mean, when we engineers and homeowners face this, this situation, we have certain regulations that we go by. If, if the conservation regulation stated something to that effect of enhanced nitrogen system, that's one of the first things that we will approach the client with. If the Board of Health regulation has that particular regulation, then that's some of the things that we have to um, approach the clients for. Um, but if it's not in the regulation, um, most clients and most homeowners don't want to go that extra step if it's not a requirement and if it's going to increase the cost of them by two, two times or three times, it will become either undoable for them um, or just it doesn't get done. Yeah, it's hard for to understand that if it, ha you know, the, the tanks did not fail, the leaching field failed, it can be engineered correctly. Um, the state says it can come, is correct complied, yeah. and complies. Mm -hmm. You know, it kind of blows me away that somebody would ask me to, to do something else. It's a non pre existing non conforming lot. It's been there for over 30 some odd years. Yes, the previous owners rebuilt it, but the, I mean, it, the, I, there's really not a whole lot you can do with a lot. <laughs> well, you said the key phrase we can ask. Um, it isn't the regulation right now, and it's incumbent upon us to do the work, uh, interface with the Board of Health, as Brad mentioned, and other experts and engineers to see if our regulations need to be adjusted. Um, but it doesn't hurt to ask. Okay. Again, this is not the first time I've asked. Well, you know that I ask this on every septic system upgrade. And I will continue to ask on every septic system upgrade until we do have a regulation in place. Because we all know what we're facing here. And it has to be corrected. Mm -hmm. And every opportunity that we miss to correct this makes the situation worse Agreed. for all of us. Agreed. So I'm not trying to single out any particular owner. I've got a septic tank myself over on Meadowbrook Road. And if it were to fail tomorrow, it would be an IA system. So, I, I, I mean, you, you guys just passed two massive projects just recently. Okay. And you're, you're asking us to spend more money with our system when this meets Title V. Yeah. And just to, just to, on that for a second, <clears throat> uh, actually, before we bought this property, we knew somebody that had been on, I'm not going to get into names, but somebody who used to be on these boards, <laughs> and he stated that they didn't like the AI, I don't know if that's the correct saying, Systems, enhanced, be, system. enhanced systems, MASHP, he said, did not like them because they found that they did not uh, work well when people weren't there all the time. And he, he put on a long list of why these other projects were being passed because mm -hmm. they found that they didn't work. Now, that, that could be hearsay, but I'm, it's, so it's even more of a shock to us because you know, when we were looking at the property, we were told, you know, that this is why this is here. It's not one of those other systems. Um, and then last but not least, to my knowledge, 
Uh, not that this makes, you know, when, when it'll happen, I don't know it. I'm not privy on all the board things. But um, there is, to my knowledge, an uh, area uh, down on Mashpee, on Monomoskoy Road, where uh, the town is now has for someday having a pump for the sewer system. So, you know, it, it's this is, you know, 15, 20 years, and that's probably going to be there in maybe another 10 or so. so. I mean, I don't know if that alleviates your concerns. Just throwing it out there. It's, it's on us, I think, as a commission to address this. It's important. The things you've said are important. And I completely understand where you're coming from. Um, the only real, the story. only real way you're going to solve problem out in the island is to bring sewer. In well, there. I think that, that I think that ultimately I understand what you're saying, and I think that 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 has to happen. Uh, you, the law, you guys have to either change the law, work for the law, or do it beforehand. It's not fair to ask somebody to spend all this money to have a septic design, have it come to state proper regulations, and then be asked these questions. <laughs> uh, totally not something that anybody would con you know, consider. They, they feel that you know, they're, they're doing everything that the state says to do. So my, again, I feel that this is something you guys need to uh, put on a ballot or however you do it. But I, I, I don't think it's fair to, to put to set each us individual up yeah. to this, this. I personally don't feel that's a fair yeah. thing to do to somebody. So we can sit yeah. down. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions and comments? Is there anyone in the audience who would like to make commentary on this hearing? Hearing none, if there's no more discussion, we'll entertain a motion. I would move the negative determination which is for your situation, what you want to hear. The negative determination is good in this regards. Uh, for Raymond Maciel Jr. and Patricia at 370 Monomoskoy Road. Uh, and, and that's my motion. Do I hear a second? Thank you, Charlie. Is there any further discussion? All right, voting. Tom? Aye. Brad? Yes. Paul? No. Charlie? Yes. I vote aye as well. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. We need to get an agenda item for this commission to get together and discuss uh, the process for moving forward on yeah. assessing our own regulations and what's within our purview with regards to because it's important yeah. and consistency matters. Agreed. Now calling the 609 hearing, 181 Daniels Island Road, LLC. 181 Daniels, Daniels Island Road. Proposed septic system upgrade. Representative is Cape and Islands Engineering. This is RDA. Good evening. For the record, Raul Isardi from Cape and Islands Engineering representing the applicant, 181 Daniels Island, LLC, for the project at 181 Daniels Island. The project, similar to the last couple of projects, is a septic upgrade for a failed system. It is an existing residence, five bedroom. There is no increase in flow proposed. There are two septic systems on the property. Um, both systems failed. Um, one of the systems is actually uh, a tank and a leaching pit, and the leaching pit is deemed to be within the reach of groundwater. For this project, what we're proposing to do is abandon the two existing leaching fields maintain the two existing tanks um, and connect it to a pump chamber. The location of the new um, upgraded septic system um, increases the separation to the coastal bank and all the other resources. The two existing leaching pits are within 100 feet of the coastal bank. The proposed leaching field will be over 100 feet from the coastal bank. But half of the leaching field is within land subject to coastal storm flowage. The septic system is also going to be enhanced with a pump chamber to lift the, the system about 6.2 feet above the adjusted high ground water. 
This system does not need any um, waivers from Board of Health. It meets all um, Title V requirements and local Board of Health requirements. It is just within the um, jurisdiction of this board, this commission, because it is in land subject to coastal storm flowage. If there's any, oh, I'm sorry. Um, one other item that we're upgrading, we're proposing a drainage system for the driveway. Um, we believe there's a, a leaching system nearby where we're proposing to do the septic system. So we have to be 25 feet away between the leaching for the septic and the leaching for any dry um, drainage for the driveway. So we're proposing a new dry well um, further away from, from the proposed septic system. If there's any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you. Drew, comments? Uh, not really much to add from what Raul had already described. It's a replacement of two failed uh, systems, no increase in design flow, and the area of proposed work is from the existing, within the existing driveway layout. So photos of commissioners haven't been off the site to see the existing conditions. Um, it's a large gravel driveway. It's a little hard to see the, the whole layout of the driveway because a lot of um, exterior construction going on in the existing home. Here, this area is entirely occupied by driveway and hardscaping. Caden can read Board of Health on this. Sure, the Board of Health states that engineer plan submitted that is still under review and it's okay for five bedrooms. <clears throat> Thank you, Drew and Caitlin. Comments from the commissioners? I'm wondering whether the uh, leach field could be lifted and moved close to the road, um, and in that way, perhaps uh, drainage would be improved significantly for that field. I mean, that, that, this, this doesn't really show the contour. You come off of Daniels Island Road, it drops down rather significantly, probably a three-foot drop to get into the lower air. I'm just wondering if you were to lift that, uh, would that improve the flow and improve the situation? If you're going to have disturbance, which you have already and you will have, to do this construction, why not raise the area that you travel to the garages or whatever on this property? So, yeah, I can... I could touch on that. Um, so one of the requirements for Title V and the local Board of Health is breakout separation. So from the edge of the septic system, 15 feet out of the system, the grades existing or proposed cannot be lower than the system itself. So if we were to pull it, that would be like the southwest corner, which is the highest point at elevation, like 16. Um, if we were to do that, we'll have to carry that 16 over the entire system then we'll lose the entire driveway and probably even the garage because 15 feet away from it, we have grades that are lower. So there's, there's a lot of things that we have to balance. So that is why some of the gradings that is being proposed here is shifting some of the grades to um, accommodate that 15 foot breakout. So there, there's, there's a delicate balance with the grades. The system cannot be more than three foot below grade and the 15 foot setback the grades around that 15 foot have to not be lower um, than the system. But we did pick it up um, from where the current two systems are, um, just not drastically. The other way we um, accounted for greater separation to groundwater is this is using, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the plastic chambers. They're kind of shallow, um, roughly eight inches tall compared to what's on the, on the ground, which is a leaching pit, which is six foot deep, and the 500 gallon chambers, which are almost three foot deep overall. So that shallower uh, plastic chamber allows us to increase separation to the groundwater. Other questions and comments from the commissioners? Basically, I have the same concerns again. So I'll ask, well, like I said, I would. Yeah, it, it's the same. Um, a, an enhanced um, nitrogen removal system doubles up easily um, the cost here. Is there an access issue as in the last presentation because of hardscape or is the access um, tank? So if, if the tanks have to be removed, that's all hardscape and part of the structures that will be involved um, is also intercepting three existing um, building sewers. Um, the one to the house has two lines going into, 
the one for the garage has one line. So it's intercepting three sewer lines, um, ripping out the, the brick patios, the, the walkways, digging out that one septic system that's near, septic tank that's near the garage, could impact that covered walkway. So it, 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 does, it does involve a lot of additional construction that a typical septic upgrade would otherwise not look into. If I may ask a question just for my general information, uh, would you characterize a IA system being put in a new construction or previous uh, lot that does not have an existing system or hardscaping or structure uh, as less costly than one where it has to be fit into an existing? So yes, if the area that, that we're dealing with is a wooded lot mm -hmm. and they're gonna go in there and clear the lot, um, punching a hole for the additional um, component, um, would not probably go to twice as much um, in the overall cost. Mm -hmm. um, but once you have a, a developed site mm -hmm. and you have to deal with existing conditions, then it, it does trigger a lot of more costs. Thank you. Other questions from our commissioners? Is there anyone in the audience who would like to make public commentary on this hearing? Okay. Hearing none, we'll entertain a motion. Okay, I would move for determination, a negative determination in regards to the application of 181 Daniels Island Road, LLC. Uh, a negative determination. Thank you. Do I hear a second? Second. If there's no further discussion, we'll vote. Tom. Aye. Brad. Yes. Paul. No. Charlie. Yes. I vote aye as well. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Now calling the 612 hear hearing for Barbara B. Nichols, trustee 23 and 24 Melissa Avenue. Proposed hardscaping, landscaping, retaining walls, and relocation of required mitigation plantings. Reference order of conditions 043-3044. Representative is the homeowner, this is an RDA. Barbara Nichols, 23 Melissa Ave. My project is at 24 Melissa. Um, and it's a 5.4 acre lot on the east side of Mashby Lake. And I propose to, um, we're re in the process of finishing up, rebuilding an old farmhouse and, and uh, getting to the point of landscaping. And we have bankings that we need to um, control. So we'd like to put in retaining walls on that plan up there where there's two walls heading out right right there, about five feet apart, four feet tall, um, and with a slight curve on the end to um, help contain the soil and prevent runoff and for safety's sake. And then on the underneath the porch on the bottom there, uh, we would like to put out one wall about 20 feet long with stairs that goes um, down maybe six feet out from the house. And this, um, I might mention, this is a continu continuation of the Ed and I'm sorted to work done under order of conditions 43, 30, 44. And then on the, um, does anybody have any questions about the walls? I'm trying to understand why you have two walls running parallel within about. Well, one is going to be higher than the other. Okay, it is. Yeah. So that's the way in which you're going to try to 
No, it does it look right beside each other, but actually mm -hmm. one, one yeah, will be the, I'm, the I'm, height. I can't quite see how many feet the increments are in. Looks like 10. They can't have magnified one foot. glass. Right. Those are one foot? I took a picture of it so I could enlarge it. <laughs> They're one foot. One foot? Yeah, oh. the highest point is 82, it looks like. No, 83. And it drops down. The first wall's at 76. The second wall's at 75. Here's that way. It, it, it just seems to me that you could use some additional gradation so that it's a, a wall here and then another wall, but do it on, on, in, a, in a way in which you, you could get greater height retention uh, if it was multiple walls. But obviously, you've had some expertise more than mine <laughs> in terms of how you would go about building a good retaining wall. Yeah. There, it, it just, to me, looks like it ought to be spread a little bit further every five feet or something on that idea in order to get the height you'd like to retain that area. Mm. And you can't tell what, what's the house like at that point. You could actually get to the point of destroying uh, views out of the property, out of the windows. <coughs> the garbage, that's just a commentary. I'll be quiet. Yeah. <laughs> And the other part of the question is, is to um, move the plantings on the original um, engineering plan. The plantings were shown in one area. And we'd like to move it to the left, which is in the area of construction, rather than disturbing the area which, where the plants are proposed, were originally proposed, is a stable lawn that's been there for hundreds of years. Um, so just to uh, get it to, in the construction type area. So where is the resource area? I can't see it. I'll go, uh, back. Where's what? Okay. So along here, if I were to put in elevation contours, right around here is the top of Inland Bank. This slopes down towards Mashby Way to Pond. It's roughly 100 feet above sea level. The lake this, is 55 this feet. Here, all the way along this Thank you very much. Questions? Uh, I'm sorry, out of turn here. Drew, comments? Um, so just to show the commissioners the site, because this really dictates why the retaining walls, this illustrates why the retaining walls are being proposed. The top left is looking at this home. This was a uh, constructed home um, issued in order of conditions by the commission just a couple of years ago, 43-3044 uh, for the construction of single family home. Uh, all this area was existing lawn, uh, where you see the house constructed all the way around here, all along. Um, this is where the, uh, the side wall with the stairway is proposed to come out. The grade, you can't really tell in the pictures, but the grade drops down pretty considerably here. Going around to the side of the home, it's this side up here. And then the back, uh, showing again, grade drops here. So this is where they want to contain some of this uh, soil. And um, just looking back up from the rear of the house towards uh, towards the driveway again. Uh, That's where the double bank would go. That's where the double bank would go. The <laughs> double. Uh, this, uh, these two images, this is just to illustrate um, the two areas where existing mitigation, or the original mitigation that's required from that order of conditions was slated to go in this area here, which is pretty much lawn right now, just dormant lawn. Uh, over here, there was some additional disturbance just from the construction activity around the home. And so um, the applicant is looking to have uh, mitigation go over this disturbed area rather than disturbing an area of lawn. Um, where it was originally slated to go. I really don't see any difference between the two areas in terms of it's directly, both areas are directly by the top of Inland Bank, both will serve as a buffer zone to the top of Inland Bank. So it's really a matter of working with uh, disturbed conditions versus undisturbed conditions. So, uh, and this is not a high maintenance lawn, this is obviously a rat fescue um, native uh, lawn mix. So, uh, I don't see any issues with switching it over from yeah. one side to the other, so that perform the same function. So um, I would recommend a negative determination. 
Yeah, not disturbing the lawn seems like it would be a, a net environmental benefit <clears throat> as opposed to putting it in the original location. I'm inclined to agree with the homeowner. Caitlin? <laughs> <laughs> The septic, um, the Board of Health states that to note the sep location of the septic system and restrict equipment, vehicle, traffic over non-load bearing H10 components. Access to all septic components must be maintained. And the building department states that if the retaining, retaining walls will require a building permit if it's over four feet in height measured from the bottom of the footing to the top of the wall prior to backfill. Thank you, Caitlin. Questions and comments from our commissioners? <clears throat> I asked my head a long time. <laughs> there was one other comment. Just this is just an observation, and it may even be like just beyond the hundred foot setback, the wetlands jurisdiction on the lot. But you've got, and I'm sure you've seen this when you pull into the parking lot just before the house. You've got a very large white pine to your left that's buried in a, a pile of fill. It has lower. beetles in it too. Oh, does it? I was yeah. going to say, as long as that trunk is covered with that fill, it's not going to be too much longer before that tree dies. Well, I'm hoping to get that out of there. As, okay. Good. You know, so I, as I would like, imagine. I, I'm sure you, you're already aware. Yeah, of it. just, just that, the, that's the concern of mine. With the, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Does have holes in it. Uh -oh. it does. Okay. Questions, comments? Is there anyone in the audience who's here to give commentary on this hearing? Hearing that I would move for a negative determination in regards to the application of Barbara B. Nichols, trustee at 23 and 24 Melissa Avenue. Thank you, Brad. Do we hear a second? Thank you, Charlie. If there's no further discussion, we'll begin voting. Tom. Aye. Brad. Yes. Paul. Yes. Charlie. Yes. I vote aye as well. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now calling the 615 for Michael J. and Jennifer G. Scholar, 220 Watling Place Road and 228 Watling Place Road. Proposed construction of elevated boardwalk and mitigation plantings. Representative is BSC Group. This is an NOI. So this has been requested by the applicant uh, and the representative to be continued. Um, the issue that they're running into is uh, trying to figure out the right location for the boardwalk and um, the overall footprint of the boardwalk. And in speaking with the, uh, the applicant consultant BSC group, the, I did inform them this is the third continuance request. Apparently they're having just communication problems trying to all get on the same page. Um, so I did advise them that this would likely be, if the commission were to approve this continuance, it would be the last one and they really need to uh, finalize things and get this presented to the commission if they want to keep moving forward with this project under this current application. So, I mean, typically we don't have a hard and fast rule about number of continuances. It always vary in terms of reasons, um, whether they're justifiable or not. Uh, so, but the unwritten rule is really three at yeah. this place. It's in the SR just on the application. Um, so, this has been requested to be continued to April 28th at 6 p.m. 28th. There's no discussion. Yes. We'll, sorry, go ahead. Mm -hmm. There's no discussion. We'll entertain a motion. I would move that we continue the application of Michael J. and Jennifer G. Scholar at 220 <coughs> Waiting Place Road and 228 <coughs> Waiting Place Road until April 28th at 6 p.m. 6 p.m. Thank you. Do I hear a second? Thank you, Charlie. Voting. Tom? Aye. Brad? Aye. Paul? Yes. Charlie? Yes. I vote aye as well. Motion carries. Now calling the 618 hearing, 149 Noisy Hole Road, noisy, <laughs> noisy Hole Road, proposed construction and maintenance of a new single family dwelling, septic system, pool and hardscaping, landscaping and vegetated storm water retention area. Representative is Bracken Engineering Incorporated. It's continued from 310. This is Nenawai. Good evening, yes, uh, my name is Don Bracken. I'm a professional civil engineer and owner of Bracken Engineering out of Buzzards Bay. 
Um, this meeting was continued uh, once to uh, allow us some time and for Drew to go back to the site with our consultant and make some plan revisions that were recommended. Um, it's, a, it's about a one and a half acre vacant lot which has frontage on both uh, Noisy Hole, which is um, a paved road with utilities and, and access. It also has frontage on Hollow Road, which is another public road, but it's not constructed except for a path um, going, down, going down to it. Uh, the land around it is owned by the town. Um, this is probably likely one of the few remaining vacant lots in the neighborhood. Um, the resource areas were delineated by Brian Madden of LEC Environmental Consultants. Um, the resource areas on the site consist of uh, bordering vegetated wetland uh, on the north portion of the site on and off the locus, uh, isolated vegetated wetland on the locus. There is a man-made ditch that sort of connects the two, but that's not in itself a resource area in this case. Um, there's also a potential vernal pool on, on the north side and a recently delineated vernal pool within the isolated vegetated wetland in this location, uh, which Drew and Brian Madden reviewed a couple of weeks ago, or a week and a half ago. Um, after that was identified, what we did was we revised the plan in order to try to consolidate uh, the development as far away from the wetland resources, but you know, especially uh, this newly identified vernal pool. Um, what we did was uh, the previous plan had a septic system outside of the jurisdiction and outside the buffer zone up in this area. We relocated the reserve area off to the west so that we could move the, the house and the driveway and, and everything in that direction. So as you can see from this plan, we're, we're showing both the 100-foot buffers from both the uh, vernal pool and BVW. Um, we were able to move all the structures outside the 100-foot buffer from the vernal pool. You can see that uh, there's a small portion of the proposed structure within the 100-foot buffer to the BVW, which is the purple line. Um, we also uh, have brought the limit of work identified right here with um, the Filtrex SOX system. As close as we could, you can see we're only about 17 or 18 feet off of the foundation, just trying to give ourselves enough room to be able to work around the house you know, for construction. Uh, Post-construction, uh, we're proposing to revegetate um, this strip that's highlighted um, uh, with uh, indigenous plants. Um, there's a letter from Brian Madden suggesting what the, what the planting should be in temporary irrigation so that that area could re-naturalize. Um, in total, the, the amount of work or disturbance within the 100-foot buffer to the BVW is 3,440 square feet. The revegetation is 2,035 square feet. Um, so there's, a, you know, um, there's about uh, 1,405 square feet net at the end of the day within the 100-foot buffer that's going to be <coughs> occupied mostly by lawn and a small portion of the proposed dwelling. Uh, those numbers represent about 3% of the total area around the lot within the, within the buffer zone. Um, to address runoff issues, uh, we're proposing drywall systems off of each corner of the building. Um, the grading is, 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 is fairly slight and manageable behind the building to the limit of work. Um, we are also proposing outside the buffer zone, but I think it's important to note a uh, small bioretention area down on the southeast corner of the lot, um, which was actually uh, part of a requirement from the planning board years ago when the lot was released. So we're, we're honoring that, that um, requirement. However, we've looked at it. There's really not much runoff going, going into that depression but it will serve to capture, you know, this small area right here. Um, there's been a lot of discussion on septic systems I heard earlier. Uh, this septic system is probably about 190 feet uh, to the BVW. Um, again, all the components are outside of the 100-foot of, of the buffer. 
And given that it's um, you know a one and a half, one and a half acre lot, we even though it's not a nitrogen sensitive area, we would meet nitrogen sensitive area requirements. Um, and with that, I think I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you. True comments. So um, this has already gone over, but I had met with uh, Brian Madden from LEC who did the uh, delineations and estimated it known that that small isolated wetland, the one you see here, um, has uh, exhibited vernal pool habitat characteristics um, on my observations in the past. And so we went out with Brian and he redelineated uh, that isolated wetland. Um, the ditch that you see connecting, it actually does not connect to this uh, certified vernal pool over here. Let's go back to the, uh, this is the certified vernal pool here. The other isolated wetland. Um, so uh, this ditch is actually closed off right here, so there is no direct hydrological connection between two, so it's not considered a wetland. That's why this is isolated, and uh, this also is an isolated wetland, a uh, freshwater wetland here the certified vernal pool. Both wetland areas exhibit uh, vernal pool characteristics. And, um, so adjustments were made, as was described, to um, do some reconfiguration to keep as much of the disturbance outside the 100 foot buffer zone to this isolated wetland as possible. And I think they've done a good job in doing that. Um, as I stated, minor incursions into the 100 foot buffer zone to the isolated wetland. Um, and there are plantings that are to be added to this drainage easement area here after construction is complete to offer some mitigation in that area, which will help to enhance that buffer zone. Um, one of the things that also we looked at, and you can see here noted on the plan, uh, let's zero in on it, so, so uh, this uh, hollow road is actually a town-owned road, and this is kind of like a, uh, it's a walking path that's been used over the years um, that links up with conservation land, which, all this area up here, all these surrounding lots, this is all conservation. So when you come down Hollow Road, <coughs> it leads right into Contom land. And so what the applicant has proposed is to uh, put up a split rail fence. Right now there's two Jersey barriers out here off a of noisy hole. We were put in by DPW years ago because we had a lot of uh, illegal dumping in this area, noisy <laughs> hole. Um, not just in this area, but other areas of noisy old conservation land, it was really off the charts dumping because of all these survey roads that were created prior to the town uh, acquiring these parcels. So this will be put in to, um, to prevent any vehicle access from going beyond this point on Hollow Road. You can see here there is a proposed driveway coming off of Hollow Road as part of this overall proposal. So the fence here uh, will stop vehicle traffic from going. It may need to be reinforced with something else later on. I mean, we've seen all kinds of attempts to mm -hmm. get over, you know, through fences and even through gates. So it's something we'll have to keep an eye on mm -hmm. um, moving forward. The commission approves the project. Um, the only other observation I had is we do require staking for all structural corners on the lot. And I didn't mm -hmm. see that when I went to do the inspection. Yeah. So if the commission approves it, yeah. I recommend a motion. Uh, Part of the motion to require that as soon as possible, so we can go out and see where these structures are. Is that just yeah. a requirement under our regulations? Yeah, we actually we had it scheduled to, to have it all staked out, and then Brian told me you wanted to meet him out there. He told us to hold yeah, off, so we didn't have a chance after that. But we definitely will do that. Yeah, okay. yeah that, exactly. It's, uh, and we do have a uh, a letter from the abutter uh, that has been requested to be read into the record. My name is Peter Cook. I live across the street from said property, 149 Noisy Hole Road. I object to the building of the house in said property for these reasons. As stated, the property is wetlands, and I really say more. The town of Mashby is concerned with nitrogen pollution and wetlands. Why would the Conservation Commission let this building go through? The area in question is a flood zone from Route 130 to Route 28. My basement floods when there is heavy rain. I can only imagine the damage to a house lower than mine. When was the last time a perk test was performed? I believe it was six to seven years ago. Is that considered up to date? 
Where are the spoils of digging a foundation, septic, and leach field and pool going to go? Backfill the wetlands? This property abuts tribal land. I hope you sent a letter to them as well. I am in opposition of this property being developed. I will be calling into the hearing to express my hate concerns. As a sidebar, I would be willing to buy the land at fair market value. I also have a couple additional comments. Uh, DPW states that Noisy Hill Road is a town-owned road, town road, and the applicant will require a curb cut permit from DPW. And the Board of Health states that no septic design plan has been submitted for Board of Health review permitting, and it is not in a zone two. I would also recommend that the project uh, mitigation areas be conditioned under Regulation 12 um, for three-year monitoring and maintenance to ensure their survival. Mm -hmm. If I may just add, the property is not in a, in a designated flood zone, so. No, it's not, it's not accurate. And there would be no disposal of um, no. fill into the wetlands. Obviously, there's been all efforts to stay out of the wetland buffer zone, so that would not happen. Uh, and it would be obviously conditioned as such. Um, Somebody tell me if there was a perk test done on this property? Yes, there were several perk tests done that, that are still valid. I, I would say might be correct. It was six or seven years ago, but they were witnessed by the Board of Health, and they're the same standards that are current. The plan states July 6, 2012, okay. for test pit information. Has it been done sooner than that? Or? Yeah, uh, they were done. Uh, a couple of different times, yeah. So I see November 10th, 2011 was one set. Um, it's point number 20. Oh, on yeah. The so, side notes. yeah. In, in, in below the soil logs, April 19th, 2012, November 10th, 2011. 12 years. It, pretty consistent, what you would expect, you know, for soil conditions. Ground, groundwater was observed in several of the test pits. Um, that's why you can see there is, the, the lot itself is around elevation 45-ish, and over the septic system, we're going to have a grade of about 48. So in order to meet groundwater separation for that, and in order to get the, uh, you know, the basement so it won't be into the water table. Other questions from our commissioners? Yes. I mean, I might as well be consistent. This is a new construction, so why not an IA system? Well, I think, number one, it's not in a nitrogen-sensitive area, and I think given the size of the lot and an IA system, the, the, in my experience, the main reason is for the reduction in nitrogen loading. Um, and with this amount of lot area, uh, the nitrogen load is probably you know, somewhere between five and 10 parts per million, which would be the goal if you were adding a nitrogen system to a nitrogen sensitive area. So I think in this particular instance, I don't think there's really much gain, you know, uh, from that, you know, given the dilution on the, on the lot itself. So, um, and the distance obviously that we're away from the, uh, the wetland area. Well, maybe you can help me understand something better. Mm -hmm. You have five feet of separation between the bed of the filter fabric and the groundwater. Correct. And your perk rate is less than two minutes per inch. Correct. So when the system is up and operational within two hours, that effluent is in the groundwater. It is, but after treatment through the soil. Right. And over years, well, and and you know, I mean, soils filter, but they only filter to a certain point, and they become saturated. So, my concern, and mm -hmm. it's not just with this mm -hmm. project; it's with all projects, mm -hmm. that if we're putting effluent into the groundwater in any environmentally sensitive area, and we have an opportunity to mitigate that before we start doing it. Why aren't we taking that opportunity? 
Well, and I, and I wouldn't disagree, but I think you, my own opinion, and from all, I work in a lot of other towns too, and, and a lot of them do require IA systems under very specific circumstances. Like for instance, um, in Bourne, if you're within 150 feet of a resource area, typically you have to put an IA system in. Um, also in Bourne, they require us to do nitrogen loading calculations, and if those calculations show that your nitrogen loading is over 10 parts per million, they're gonna require you to put one in. Um, you know, same thing with, with some other towns that we work in, but I think like even in, you know, we do a lot of work on the Nantucket, and like 80% of the, because of their regulations, 80% of them would have IA systems, but even in those two towns that are very stringent with that, they would not require an IA system in our situation that we have here uh, um, because, of the, because of the land area and nitrogen loading. So um, I don't disagree that they're needed in a lot of situations, but I, <laughs> I heard the conversations and I've been dealing, dealing with you know, IA systems for many years and yeah. um, it makes sense you know, to come up with like, like you've been talking about, in my, my opinion, based on my experience. So. Kind of frustrating, <laughs> to say the least. It means we have work to do. Uh, yeah, we do. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. You're Other welcome. questions and comments? Hearing none, is there anyone in the audience who would like to make commentary on this hearing? The uh, individual who wrote the letter said they would call in. Has anyone else joined our? Is anyone on the line to comment on 149 Noisy Hole? All right. Hearing none, we'll entertain a motion. There are two recommended conditions, um, one re requiring staking for the con prior to construction, and the other is the maintenance suggestion uh, to ensure planting stake for the next three years. At your discretion to include. Years. Okay, because I've got a third. I thought I heard things like uh, no dumping in the wetland area and probably as well uh, control of any building materials to keep it out of the wetland area as well during, during construction. Right. Okay, so I would move that we close an issue in regards to the application of James Culloway, trustee at ABCAM Realty Trust 149 Noisy Hole Road with the conditions that we stake the property as soon as possible that there be no dumping in the wetland area and that storage of any building materials in the wetland area during the construction period and that any plantings called out on this plan be uh, verified and checked every three years. Four, three years. Four years. Four, four three year period. Four, three years. Okay. That was an impressive motion even by your standards, Brad. <laughs> Do I hear a second? Thank you, Tom. If there's no further discussion, we'll Mr. begin. Mr. Chairman, I have a yes. question. Of course, um, Is there an issue of back taxes on this lot that are outstanding, or has that been clarified? That has been it's all set. taken care of. <clears throat> That's been taken care of. Yes. Okay. As of today. Okay. Good call. There's no further discussion. We'll vote. Tom. Aye. Brad. Yes. Paul. No. Charlie. No. I vote aye. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now calling the 621 hearing, Douglas and Annette McLeod, Nine Tide Run. Proposed construction of additions to existing dwelling, replacement of driveway and septic system upgrade. Representative Cape and Islands Engineering, continued from 310, this is an NOI. Good evening, for the record, Raul Isardi from Cape and Islands Engineering, and Doc here, the um, homeowner um, and applicant for this application. Um, this application was presented um, to this board a couple of weeks ago. It was continued for um, revisiting um, the septic flow um, and the septic design for this project. Um, so originally this project was presented as an increase in flow from existing three bedroom house to four bedrooms um, with the Title V septic system in the front of the property. Um, it was continued and the septic and the flow was revised to keep the 
um, development as a three-bedroom house, therefore not, not an increase in flow, and a Title V septic system upgrade. Um, so the septic tank will be relocated because the, the proposed addition is placed over the location of the existing tank. So there's a new septic tank to meet the setbacks um, to the structures and to the street um, property line. Then the existing leaching pit will be removed and replaced with a Title V leaching system. Um, so in terms of um, improvements in terms for the septic system, the leaching pit removal and replacement with a um, leaching field with five and a half foot of separation to grab water. It's a great improvement um, in terms of septics. I understand there will be debate about the, um, enhanced denitrifying septic systems um, for this for this location, but like all the all the systems um, in this area and all the projects that we've seen um, tonight, um, as not as being not an increase in flow. Um, this septic system, system upgrade does provide improvements over what's existing on the ground. So although it is probably not the most improvement that some um, people would rather see, it is still an improvement over the existing conditions. Um, the system as it sits, it does meet um, Title V setbacks, over 50 feet to coastal banks, over 100 feet to, to the salt marsh and so forth. Um, and it does provide more than five feet separation to the groundwater. Um, if there is any questions, um, Doug and I um, will try to answer. Sure, comments. Um, the proposed additions are all in predisturbed, legally altered areas, not getting any closer to the wet and resource areas. Um, the proposed increase in flow, house is being kept to three bedrooms. And Caitlin can read Board of Health. Fort Hill states that engineer plans submitted and approved for four bedrooms, permit to be issued upon license installer assignment and payment. If I could probably add to that comment, um, the health department has probably not seen the three bedroom redesign. Right. That's, sure. that's yeah. why the comment on four bedrooms. Right. But the three bedroom is a smaller system, so I don't see any issue why they wouldn't approve it also. Thank you, Comments from our commissioners? It's been quite a night. Um, I told you I would ask, so I'm asking. Um, you, did you say you were taking the, the tank is coming out and this is a new tank that's going in? Yes, um, the existing tank is where the new addition is happening, so it has to come out. The existing okay. tank has to come yeah. out. So you have to put a new tank in yep. regardless. So there's not an access issue here at all? Access is not an issue. Um, the switch from a Title V septic tank to a denitrifying septic component, because mm -hmm. um, it could be just, just a tank, in terms of material, it's probably twice as much in materials. In terms of the lifetime of the system, it's a um, yearly maintenance um, reporting. Yep. So on the homeowner, whoever that happens to be, will be a burn on a yearly basis for, I believe, the first two or five years, it's a quarterly um, inspection. Mm -hmm. So that's an additional financial um, component that will, will be added to, to a project like this. So is there any chance that the owner would consider that? Well, we reduced it from a four bedroom to a three bedroom because of cost. So. If we were going to do that, we'd be just keeping with our original four bedrooms. So it's, it's not something we're looking to do. Okay. Other questions and comments from our commissioners? Is there anyone in the audience who's here to give commentary on this hearing? All right. If there's no further discussion, I'll entertain a motion. This is an NOA. Move that we close an issue in regards to Douglas S. And w. McLeod at nine tide run for changes and upgrades to their septic system. I didn't hear any conditions. Did I miss any? Oh, it's also a home additions. And a home addition. Home addition. Do I hear a second? Second. I think Charlie uh, crossed the finish line on that one first. There's no further discussion. We'll vote. Tom. 
Aye. Brad. Yes. Paul. No. Charlie. Yes. I vote aye as well. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Now calling the 624 hearing, Edward, Edward D. Ruddite Papelli, 55 Redwood Circle, proposed shed and retaining wall installation with mitigation plannings. Representative is the homeowner. This is an RDA. I apologize for my voice. I apologize for my pronunciation of the surname. Had, uh, oh, DD is fine. I've had laryngitis for three days, so I apologize. Um, we would like to uh, put a shed down at the bottom of our property. Um, it's a 10 by 12 shed. We're about uh, 28 feet from Mashpee Wakefield Pond and 35 feet um, on the uh, corner um, on the other side from the river. Um, we would not have to um, cut down any trees or anything. It's it, it's as lightly landscaped by that. It's really just um, some grass there right now. So we would not have to cut down anything to put this in. We would put a base, a foundation down. Uh, it's a shed kit and it would be delivered by um, in pieces, unassembled and they would bring it down because of the slope of our property. We would put a retaining wall behind it. <coughs> and, uh, uh, you know, we would put plantings down also and things like that. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Take your time, man. <laughs> um, I, um, you know, there is, um, we do have that slope, and on that slope there is already bushes and whatnot and some trees, um, but we would add more just, you know, for mitigation purposes. Um, I don't know what else to say. I'm not used to this type of thing. Oh my I'm doing God. fine. <laughs> you covered every, all the bases. <laughs> yes, okay. <laughs> Are there any questions? You're still talking. Yeah, I'll uh, ask our conservation agent to give his commentary and then I'll ask the commissioners for questions for you. So, um, in many cases with sheds, particularly ones that are you know, prefab, pre uh, to be constructed, um, if they're being placed in a predisturbed area, we, we oftentimes provide administrative approval for that because it's really nothing to, uh, or if they're outside the treatment for buffer, I should say, in a predisturbed area, there's really nothing to deliberate over. Yeah. This came forward as an RDA, a recommended RDA, because of its proximity to two resource areas. I don't see an issue with proximity, but it is within 50 feet uh, or shorter distance of the Mashpee River, <coughs> which you can see in this photo here, these are the jetties where the outlet of, of the river starts. Um, so it's within Riverfront and it's also within um, Landowner Water Bodies and Waterways associated with Mashpee Pond. So given its proximity to those resource areas is why I would recommend coming in with an RDA uh, for this application. And um, <coughs> you can see here on the plan, just a, a denotation of where this shed is going, a very basic graphic um, showing the fed, and you can see in the packet as well, this is just an illustration of the type of shed that we're looking to install. And then um, the applicant has covered the details as far as installation methodology. So my recommendation was to come in with an RDA. I did say that because of the proximity of setback to the shed, that it will um, require some mitigation. Not a lot, but at least some. And so you can see here, um, mm -hmm. these are some images of the site. Top left, this is uh, the existing home from the road. At the top right, this is a uh, this all, this all kind of ornamental landscape area, stairway coming down to the lawn. Uh, and then you see the resource areas out here. There's the outlet to the Mashpee River at uh, Mashpee Way on the background. Where this, I'm assuming this is dock section. Yeah. Yeah. That's where the shed is going. Um, so again, no removal of trees or bush section, probably going a little bit in front of this right here. Um, 
where these are stacked up uh, seasonal rock pieces. And then we can look at some areas uh, along the edge uh, where it borders the pond to look at some mitigation um, for the shed. Um, so in these, these areas of the And uh, no other comments. <coughs> Negative determination. Thank you, Drew. Caitlin? Sure. The Board of Health states just to note the location of the septic system is restrict equipment, vehicle traffic over non-load bearing HN components, access to all septic components must be maintained. And the building department just states that um, the project has been approved for the placement of the shed by this department. A building permit would be required for retaining a well that is over four feet in height measure from the bottom of the footing to the top of the wall prior to backfill. Thank you. Questions from our commissioners? There's no septic on this shed, so I'm thankful for that. Yeah. Get a rest on this one. <laughs> uh, how much mitigation planning would we require for that? The size Discussion. of the shed? I was thinking just this one to one to the square root of the shed. Yeah. Some reasonable. And along that fence area you're talking? Yeah. yeah. Somewhere somewhere along just to create more of a buffer zone between the uh, grass area and the yeah, at the shrubbery type of vegetation, so it keeps the view of the pond. Yeah. I know it's unusual to condition an RDA, so we can probably, if everyone's comfortable, get away with allowing the homeowner to work with the conservation agent sure. to develop that. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Yep. Great. <laughs> Minimal plan. All right. I think I know the answer to this one, but does anyone <laughs> in the audience have any comments to make? <laughs> All right. Hearing none, we'll entertain a motion. I would move for a negative determination in regards to the application of Edward D. and Rudite Pilpel, 55 Redwood Circle. Thank you, Brad. Do we have a second? I'll second that. Sure. Ooh, thank you. Oh, Paul Beecher. Paul Beecher. Okay. Be quicker, Charlie. <laughs> There's no time, time to go. <laughs> no further discussion. We'll begin voting. Tom. Hi. Brad. Hi. Paul. Yes. Charlie. I vote I as well. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, be feel better. Touch. <laughs> we'll be in touch about the mitigation. Okay, okay, great. Through. Thank you so much. And thanks to both of you sure. for your help. Right. Now calling the 627 hearing for Brian M. Nicole K. Clark, 138 Waterway. Proposed pier extension, ramp relocation, and float expansion. Representative of Cape and Islands Engineering, this is an NOI. So this has been requested to be continued to allow uh, more time for the shellfish constable to assess any impacts on land containing shellfish in the pier extension and flow expansion. And the continuance request is for April 14th at 6.09 p.m. There's no further discussion. We'll entertain uh, can I just ask the question? Yes. I, I'm interested in the fact that the shellfish Constable is going to go out there, but there is no navigation review of this particular Spinnaker Cove, extremely narrow. Uh, it's very difficult for two good sized boats to navigate there. They're, if their ropes stretch in the least little bit, everybody stops, and that's because you're going to go back all the way around. Right. Uh, and so, therefore, I think that the, the uh, harbor master should probably take a look at it. Yeah, he yeah, has, has commented comments, on so. it. No. Oh, he has? Yes. Okay. What did he have to say? Out of curiosity, um, I reviewed the plans. This proposed dock extension uh, will not will decrease the channel width in the area, but not to less than the narrowest point, which is located further to the north. There is still room for two vessels of moderate size to pass in the area, and since this is all no wake, all vessel area already moving at a slow speed. Okay, good. All right, the case, uh, I would move that we close an issue in regards no, to the uh, no. continuous request. Continue. Oh, I'm sorry. That's April right. 14th, I'll put it all down and move to uh, continue this application of Brian and Nicole Clark to April 18th at 6:09. April 14th. Okay. Well, April 14th at 6:09. Thank you, Brad. Do we hear a second? Second. Thank you, Charlie. Voting. Tom. Aye. Brad. Yes. Paul. Yes. Charlie. I vote I as well. Motion carries. So we'll return now to our pre-post hearing items, uh, picking up with uh, something that Mr. Sweet brought to our attention this week. 
and I wholeheartedly support and I'm embarrassed that I didn't make the suggestion. I uh, would like to begin our meetings with the Pledge of Allegiance, as does our select board. Is there any discussion on this uh, within the commission? Only I noticed it as I was listening to the select board. I noticed that Carol called for that, and others mm -hmm. did as well at other times, and it was like I was shocked. We just, it, it just somehow fell by the wayside. Because right. yeah. I can recall when I was in Chad's role, we did that all the time without, without you know, any reason to fall. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, given that, um, it should be done. Absolutely. Just an oversight for a number of years. I don't know where it broke down, but we should do it. So let's do it. And I think it's something that brings unity even when we are, um, BS at each other and, um, <laughs> and not real happy with each other. Starting each meeting with that might bring some more civility to our <laughs> politics. No question. Sure it's. Do we need a roll call vote for this, or is this something we can? Uh, I think it's something you can just agree upon. If you wish to take a roll call to make it a formal uh, decision, that's your call. I think we'll do a roll. Entertain a motion to uh, adopt the Pledge of Allegiance before all Conservation Commission meetings. Second. Voting. Tom. Aye. Brad. Yes. Paul. Yes. Charlie. Yes. I vote aye as well. Motion carries. We will also be sure to add it to the agenda. We will add it to the agenda so you have a reminder <laughs> um, for all future meetings. Yeah, whatever you write on this, I read. So. <laughs> That's good to know. <laughs> if you'd like to, Drew. Um, sure. Take away with the updates. Yeah. So uh, Redbrook Road culvert still ongoing. Um, we did extend the timeline for the bog to be the main drains uh, while Horsley Witten has placed uh, water flow monitors uh, in and around the culvert area. So they did ask for more time, and I did think it's up until April. Got the exact date, mid-April, roughly, uh, while this bog will remain drain. I did forward that on to the association president uh, of the uh, Seabrook Shores Village Association. And he did get back to me and uh, thanked me for the notification. Um, concerns or complaints about that. It's really in the interest of just making sure that the assessment uh, is thorough and accurate. Um, and then uh, there is, just a, as an aside, there is a phase one inspection that's, uh, that's that happening today, I believe, uh, of all days to schedule that, but um, given the weather. But uh, so there is an engineering firm that went out today, I'm assuming, uh, to perform a phase one inspection, which is phase one inspections are required by the Massachusetts Office of Dam Safety for dams that uh, receive a hazard class rating of um, significant or um, I forgot what the highest, I think it's, there might be one rating higher than significant. But if you, if you have dams in town that are rated as significant hazard class, then we have three of them here. Um, that being said, two at Pond Dam, Mashby at the Route 130 uh, Dam. These are earthen embankments uh, type of dams. And then Redbrook Road Culvert. All three of them have been deemed significant hazard uh, class dams. So if they were to fail, they would cause significant damage to downstream areas and homes. Uh, so those types of uh, dams with that rating have to be inspected every five years. Um, if it's a low class hazard rating, moderate, um, then uh, they, the inspection rate is every 10 years. And so the Mashpee Outlet Dam um, and the Johns Pond Fish Ladder uh, are both uh, low hazard classification, so they only have to be inspected once every 10 years. Um, any questions on that? And uh, Upper Quashnet, uh, we should be seeing, I did talk to our consultant Horsley Witten group on the Upper Quashnet, and we should be seeing something uh, in terms of the conceptual restoration alternatives within the next couple of weeks. They're still working on finalizing the conceptual restoration plan. Um, bylaw Review Subcommittee, I'll say right off the bat, the next regulation, we'll look at uh, creating a deal with nitrogen water and septic systems. We'll put that at the forefront. Can I ask a question? Um, the old regulations, was it regulation 30 that addressed that? Yeah. And that went away? Yes. 
What was the reason that? It was some of the language and some of the requirements uh, in the regulation were just too hard. Yeah. So that was that could be a model for revised regulation. Yeah, maybe use some of that language. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. We, we, far we can send out um, that old uh, regulation for review. I actually have it. I, that's one of the older ones that I was using, and Drew said, well, where did you get that? I said, I downloaded it from the website right. at one point, maybe yeah. when I first came on. Yeah. So I've got both the old and the new. And we have language from other towns who've incorporated yeah. this. Right. Yeah. 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 Born, I think, was mentioned. Uh, yeah, Born got a good plug tonight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not my business there, but the town I have, uh, I have sent off the draft regulations 12 and 27 as mitigation. Regulation 12 and regulation 27 docks piers, residential docks piers and floats. To town council for review, so we'll uh, we'll wait to hear back from council, and then once that his review is finalized, assuming there are no changes, the next step would be promulgation at a public meeting of those changes, and that will be advertised in the paper. If there are changes, we'll bring it back before the commission to have that discussion and public comment, and then um, when it becomes finalized, we'll do promulgation. So it remains to be seen how that will pan out. Uh, also, you also all received, I, I sent out a, um, the town is, has received a municipal vulnerability program grant fund to have uh, this consulting firm, Fuss and O'Neill, take a look at all the town's regulations and bylaws to see where they could be strengthened, modified, um, and, and this, is, this is for all the bylaws existing for stormwater and anything that affects water quality. Um, and um, municipal vulnerability in, in the face of climate change. So that includes our regulations. So I did send that out to everybody. The, uh, our director of natural resources, Ashley Fisher, is working with this consultant, Fusson O'Neill, to um, take a look at all of these uh, regs and bylaws uh, as part of this grant. So I would ask that, um, that the commissioners take a look at this. And if you have any feedback on the suggestions, some of them examples are like expanding the buffer zone uh, from 100 feet to 150 or maybe even 200 feet, uh, expanding jurisdiction, um, looking at um, some, making some changes to our flood zone regulations, uh, perhaps a tree bylaw. Um, so there's a lot of interesting and, and really, in yeah. my opinion, just in a cursory review, very good ideas that they've put forward uh, for the commission's consideration. So it would be really great to get your feedback on that as part of their review, mm -hmm. which will be concurrent. Yeah. Well. And the letter gave us the deadline, right? What's that? The, the letter. Oh, yeah, April 8th. April 8th. April 8th. You, want your, yeah, you want to get all uh, comments in by April 8th. Yes. If you want to send them to me, and I'll forward them on to, um, to Ashley and, and Bustamonia. And let's see. John's Pond Milfoil. I spoke with the contractor who performed the treatment on John's Pond uh, from Milfoil just to get. Uh, going on scheduling a follow-up survey for John's Pond. He said he doesn't anticipate seeing any milfoil because they, they said the initial treatment was highly successful, but we want to make sure, we want to make 100% sure. Uh, and he said mid to late May is the best time to do that because that's when the milfoil starts to uh, reveal itself at that time. So, um, so we get going on just preparing for that uh, and scheduling for that, and I also let him know about Santua Pond, uh, where we discovered milfoil towards the end of last season. So that will also be surveyed and subsequently treated, depending on the results of the survey. And uh, I'll hand it over to Caitlin for a top take Bob. Thank you. Um, the contract is being finalized between the town and Horsley Witten to complete the phase two, which is preliminary and final design and permitting um, for the restoration. And we'll let you know as soon as that um, that contract is executed. Thank you. Thank you, Caitlin. Questions, comments, other business from our commissioners? Have you heard anything from the consultants on the LCP at all? Um, they, uh, yeah, t today, um, last minute, I was brought into a meeting with the uh, Natural Resource Department and found out that there is a meeting forthcoming with the conservation staff and there will also be workshops, um, which I did not receive the dates for yet. I think April 9th is. I believe that's the first one, yes. But um, there is 
a forthcoming meeting with um, Weston and Sampson with the conservation staff regarding the draft that they've created. Mm -hmm. And there should be a meeting uh, subsequent to that that does have commission members involved, brought to the commission as well. Great. And we'll keep everybody updated as that moves forward. Yep. Yep. Other business? Hearing none, we'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Voting. If there's no further discussion, Tom. Aye. Brad. Yes. Paul. Yes. Charlie. Yes. Vote aye as well. Motion carries. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody.